You know, there's a, there's a number of, uh, of things that we believe just because we believe them. In other words, there's things that we've been taught or that we've heard so many times that it just, it's just something you just trust because you've heard it so many different times in the past. I'll give an example. My folks uh, worked, uh, my dad worked for a hospital chain and my mom was a school nurse. So literally every a bit of health advice uh, that it could possibly be related to a, food, you know, a dietary choice or an activity, I've heard it all. An example. Uh, I'm not a big fan of vegetables. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm not a big fan of vegetables. Well, my folks would say, no, vegetables, that's, that's where it's at. And, and so, like, we'd have carrots. And, and uh, my mom would say, hey, you've got to have, have some of the carrots. Now, what benefit do you think she said would come from the, the carrots? Good right, good eyesight. Well, you know, I found out years later that that's not necessarily true, that you get to a certain level of beta-carotene in your system as it is, and that you could eat carrots until the cows came home and it wouldn't necessarily give you the superhuman vision. All that to say, whether it's an apple a day, keeps the doctor away, or the carrots, I heard every bit of health advice. Some of it was good and helpful, and honestly, if I followed it all, I'd probably be in better shape. Uh, but with that said, there isn't necessarily, for every truism you've ever heard, a truth behind it. Now, in Scripture, it can also be so. In theology, it can be so. Let me, let me give you the best example I, I can of this. There was a study done uh, just a few years ago where uh, they would approach, a, a pollster would approach people on the street corners in major cities and would ask people to quote uh, their favorite Bible verse or quote any Bible verse if they, if they had trouble figuring something out. Now, most of us, if we were to pick, excuse me, to pick a citation, we'd say, I don't know, uh, you know John 3.16, you know, for God so loved something or other. We'd do something like that. But that wasn't the question. The question was, quote a verse. Now, can you guess what the number one response for the most quoted Bible verse amongst our fellow peers and the North American population is? Can you guess what the number one most quoted verse was? All right, I have heard about five answers, and all of them, honestly, you're, uh, all those are things you, you hear, that's for sure. But the number one most often responded one was this verse, this famous verse, and, and I, I'm sure your mind is immediately going to go right to the place in the Bible where you'll find it. The verse is this, God helps those who help themselves. This was the number one response. People said, that, uh, you know, if I have to quote a verse, what have I heard? What have I heard? God helps those who help themselves. Now, let me ask you, what is the problem with citing that as your favorite Bible verse? It's not a Bible verse. It's not in the Bible. In fact, what the Bible actually teaches is the exact opposite of that verse. So the number one most repeated Bible verse in our country is God helps those who help themselves, which is cruelly ironic because the reality is the story of Scripture is of a God who helps us when we couldn't help ourselves. What do you think grace is? If God saved those who helped themselves, then our salvation would not be by grace. It would be a debt he owes me because I earned it. I help myself and then you help me out. I do enough things and then you let me into heaven. That's the default mindset a lot of folks have. So I say all that only to say this. It's possible that in the theology of our day and age, in a world and a country where God helps those who help themselves is the number one Bible verse, it's possible that other doctrinal errors have seeped in as well. And I can assure, I can assure you that that's exactly what's happened uh, but tonight, we're going to look at one in particular that uh, deals with the end times, a, a doctrine, a concept called the rapture. Now, let me tell you at the outset, the concept of the rapture, uh, or harpazo, is a Greek term, the idea of being uh, called up, called out, the, the concept of the rapture is biblical, okay? The concept itself is biblical. The idea of, of God calling up, even meeting in the air, his saints, all that's biblical. But the way the word is used, the rapture in the modern vernacular, in books like Left Behind and so forth, is not biblical. You know, before I went to seminary, I was 
feeling, I guess, some sense of God doing something in my heart and mind to try to help me grow in my faith. And so I, I went to a couple different you know, uh, Christian bookstores. And at that time, uh, I did not maybe have the, the, the discernment I, I, I hope I'm starting to have now, but I didn't have much discernment at all then. I, I presumed if it was in a Christian bookshelf and it's on, the, you know, it's on the shelf in front of me, I presumed eh, someone vetted this, right? Someone somewhere has said that this is orthodox or biblical or good. I mean, they wouldn't sell me lies, would they? What do you think? <laughs> well, R.C. Sproul kind of famously said that if Jesus was to return right now, he wouldn't go to the money changers and to the dove salesmen. He'd go to the Christian bookstores because that's where a lot of the commercialization and the marketing of the faith is being done in ways that are not necessarily in conformity with the faith. Well, when it comes to the end times, uh, those who have a, a desire to commercialize aspects of Christianity have found no more fertile ground than an end times theology. Why do you think that is? Everybody wants to know. Yeah, that's right, because everyone wants to know. This room, I'm looking at, this is the busiest this room has been on any Wednesday night I've taught. <laughs> I mean, is that a coincidence? It's probably the turkey. It's the turkey and the <laughs> stuffing and, and, and such. This is a topic, I, and I don't, I, I don't, it's not a, uh, it, I'm glad you're here. It's, it's no shame to be interested in this. I'm interested in this. This is an interesting topic. But what's happened is that, that those, uh, the money changers of our age have also noted that this is an interesting topic and it has been commercialized greatly to the point that fictional representations of God's word have become a substitute for that which is true. Well, and we're going to try to we're going to try to cover that we're going to try to cover that tonight. But what I would say is that uh, there has been a cottage industry for for really decades. It goes back to the '70s. Does anyone know what the I think the top book in the 1970s was? The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey, a dispensational, which we're going to get to that term in a, in a little bit, but a, a book that uh, had um, views of the end time that that uh, just to be charitable, I would say I, I would dis disagree with. Uh, it's the number one book, and most of the books that followed didn't even tr try to be a theological. Uh, the Left Behind series is the most the biggest example, just a, a fictional account. And yet, for most people, the default understanding of what's going to happen to the church in the end times is driven by a fictional understanding of what they've learned through books and movies, not necessarily from Scripture. Now, I say that, although I, I hope and trust many in this room are already come into this with a bit of a head start on where I'm going theologically, but I'm going to teach this as, as if we're all kind of encountering this uh, for, for the first uh, time. So tonight we're going, to, uh, we're going to look at some of the verses, uh, the relevant verses. I put a handful of them up on the board here if you, if you can see that or want to write them down later. But I'm going to look at a handful of verses that do speak to the concept of harpazo or the rapture. There are verses germane to this. So to be clear, I am not discounting a rapture. There is a rapture, but I'm redefining it, or at least I'm defining it biblically as opposed to on the basis of, uh, of uh, the, fic the fiction of our age. So let's, let's go, just go ahead and let's dive in. Uh, and look at some of these verses. I'm going to look at some of these verses uh, tonight briefly, briefly. I may jump back to them as we go. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about chronology and time frames. I'm going to say, all right, here's what those who believe in a rapture, in a God bringing a secret exit of his church, here's when they think that will happen, and here's what Scripture seems to say. So I'm going to talk about chronology and time frames. I'm also going to talk a little bit about where rapture theology came from, because it didn't start in the 70s, it didn't start in the past 20, 50 years, uh, but it's not terribly old either. Does anyone know how old rapture theology is? Yeah, about 200-ish years. 1830s, give, give or take. Everything that you've ever heard from dispensationalism or the rapture or anything like that, however you define it, I can assure you it is uh, newish in the, the, uh, the chronicles of, uh, of uh, Christendom. It's, it's only a couple hundred years old. All right, so let's talk passages. In 1 Thessalonians, I'm going to go to some of the meatiest ones right out of the gate. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. Let me read this text. 
And as I read it, you're going to hear this idea of a, of a rapture, but then we're going to define what it, what it means. So 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18 say this. Now, this is Paul. He's writing to the church in Thessalonica, and they're very worried that they might have missed out on Jesus' coming and, and all the neat events that were supposed to happen. They were freaked out that they missed it. So this is Paul writing them, telling them, no, 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 here's how it's going to play out. So it's this. He says this. He says, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant concerning those who've fallen asleep, meaning that those who, who've died, lest you are to sorrow as, as those who have no, no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep, those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and who remain at the coming of the Lord... So it's the idea, some are dead, but not everyone will be dead when he comes back. So he says, those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. He says there's going to be one resurrection. They're going to come out of the ground. Those who are alive will join them, and then we're going to see they're going to meet in the air. So there, those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. This is not a secret. This is a, something that's going to be evident to, to all mankind. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain, with, uh, remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we will always be with the Lord. All right. This is one of the key verses that speak to this idea that God's elect, God's people, the church, will rise to meet him, will be taken out, okay? This is one of the verses that absolutely affirms the idea that God's people will be taken out. But when does it happen? What's the context? What's going down when that happens? Christ's return, okay? Are we in agreement that seems to say that? He's going to, what's that? Yeah, it's the second coming, the parousia, he's coming back. So at the, his return, Christ returns, the trumpet sound, the voice of the archangel, literal dead people are raised, and those who are alive at the same time meet and join him in the air. That happens at the end, not seven years earlier, not 20 years earlier, not in some secret. How, how is the rapture usually depicted in popular, uh, in, you know, in popular culture? It's this, right, it's this, it's this secret rapture. It's this, it's this deal that the church one day, we're all going to be kind of doing our things, and all of a sudden, you know, we're going to disappear, and there's going to be this pile of clothes. How many movies have you seen where there's this pile of clothes that's just kind of sitting there? You know, people have this idea that what will happen, you know, is that Christ will secretly, you know, he'll whistle, and the people will, wherever they're at, they'll just, you know, like, like Scotty in Star Trek, they'll materialize up in heaven, they'll disappear, and they'll just be a pile of clothes. And when that happens, everyone will freak out because planes will drop from the air, and, and cars will suddenly be driverless, and no one will be a Chick-fil-A, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> sorry, I just had to throw that on. So, so you see the idea, though. They, that's what popular culture has done, and it's very commercial. Honestly, that's a fascinating... If that's the way it went down, that's a fascinating outcome. I mean, it's not really the outcome I want per se, but it's, it's, it's a fascinating one to depict. And that's, in fairness, most of us, maybe not all of us, but most of us at one time in our understanding of the faith might well have thought that that's the way it, it panned out. But the very first block of text, there's only four verses in the whole Bible or four passages that deal with what we call the rapture. And what I'm going to establish, as we've just done in the first one, is to say, hold the phone here. This is not some secret thing where Christ's people disappear and everyone looks around, wonders where they went, and then goes about their business and figures out how to get along without them. That's not the depiction. What the depiction is given of the rapture is God calling his people to himself at the final bell, the final trumpet, the voice of the archangel. All right, let me read another, uh, another couple texts here. Uh, let me jump ahead. I'll do, we did 1 Thessalonians 4. Let me jump ahead to 2 Thessalonians 2.14 because this is another passage where the Thessalonians are still kind of confused about some of these things. So 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 1 through 4 say this. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if the day of the Lord had already come. Remember, some people were saying it already happened. 
They've already gone. You know, the piles of clothes, they've already disappeared. And he says, no, no, no. I don't want you to be worried about that as if I had spoken or written it to you or anything like that. It has not gone down. So he says, um, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him, uh, don't be shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or word by letter as though that day had come. Let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. There is a series, depending on your eschatology, and in fairness, even in the Reformed Presbyterian world, people, even in my vocation, there's people with a lot of different ideas of, of the end times. So to be clear, this is an area, because we don't know all things, we have to be humble about and, know, and say, I, I don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. But in general, the general consensus, at least within the theological stream that our church is in, is that things at some juncture may indeed uh, get worse, that there may indeed be a season of tribulation. Maybe it's seven years, maybe it's not. There may well be an antichrist figure or a man of sin in this season. There may be great persecution. In fact, there's a lot of reason to think maybe that's exactly what happened. And maybe there'll be a, a tremendous falling away, either in the years preceding that or right during it. Again, I'm, I'm just kind of brought with a broad paintbrush saying that there's a lot of different things that may occur in this rough season of time towards, towards the end. But what Paul is saying is that there will be notable things that will happen. In 2 Thessalonians 2, he says there's going to be a falling away that's going to precede it. In 1 Thessalonians 4, he says the dead are going to rise ahead of, ahead of time. Again, these are things to help you know you haven't missed it. So this is what he's telling the Thessalonians. All right. Let me read uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. It's actually, I think, 51 and 52. This is the resurrection chapter. Now, Paul's writing to a different audience, but again, people who don't know how things pan out. They know we live, we die, and we hope that good things happen afterwards. So in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, okay, let me explain the good things. Let me tell you what will happen. Jesus Christ, he died as, as you will die. But he didn't stay dead. He is resurrected, and he's the first fruits of your resurrection. And in due time, you who have faith in him will be resurrected just as he was. So the whole chapter is, is Paul talking about the resurrection of, of believers. So he says this. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery, which really I'm sure got the attention of everyone. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep... Some will, some will be dead. We shall not all sleep, uh, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. The trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. It's the same thing that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. He said, here's what's going to go on. The, the, archangel, the voice of our archangel, Jesus is going to reappear. The, he's going to come again, the parousia. His return will be marked by these sounds and these sights and these events and, and, and the like. And he says, at this time, at the last trumpet, not some early trumpet, not a preliminary trumpet, but at the end, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, and we shall be changed in a moment at the twinkling of an eye. So Paul's talking about the same sequence of events. He's talking about a rapture. He's talking about God's people being taken to him in victory at the end, okay? Not on a plane somewhere where your clothes fall and no one knows what goes on and, and, and history keeps moving forward. Nothing like that. He says, Jesus is going to return. He's going to say, everybody, out of the pool. That's it. That's all. That's the end, okay? That's the general understanding in our vein of theology and our vein of theology it, it attempts, as best we humanly can, to match up with what the Word says. All right, let me read the, the, one more passage. And this is uh, what we're talking about in the sermon this Sunday. So I'll explain this at greater length uh, on Sunday, because I'm literally looking at this exact same text. Let me read a number of verses from Matthew 24. This is where the great passage, the Olivet Discourse, where Jesus talks about the end of time. He also talks about the end of the Jewish age. For those of you who are here this past Sunday, we kind of explained what he was uh, getting into about that. But let me just read the text, and I'll briefly uh, give a little input for tonight. So Matthew 24, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, 
and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Sound familiar? And they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. There is some dispute on exactly what this means, but if you just take the literal understanding of what it says, it matches up everything Paul said. There's going to be some moment Jesus is going to come back, there's going to be trumpets, and everyone's going to be gathered. So that's what we see here in, in verses, uh, uh, the middle verses there in Matthew 24. Now, we also see a couple of additional verses that sometimes people make a really uh, big error with theologically. Let me read what it is. It, he says, as the days of Noah were, as the days of Noah were, so also will be, be the, the coming, the days of the Son of Man. So he says there's going to be some commonality between Noah's days and the days when Jesus comes back. Now, what do we know about Noah's days? It was bad. It was wicked. It was sinful. Right. No one pines for the days of Noah. We're not like, boy, the church really needs to go back to the golden age of Noah. You know, We don't do that because Noah's days are renowned for being bad and just unrighteous. And there was a, a very few, very few that were saved from that group. So Matthew 24 says that, that the return of the Son of God will be similar. The things that are going on in that age will be similar to that going on in the days of Noah. Uh, for as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving a marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and they did not know that the flood would come, and it took them all away. Well, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, and the other will be left. Two men will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour the Lord is coming. Now, when we hear that with our 21st century evangelical ears, we hear two people are there, then one disappears, right? We get this picture, one's gone, and look, there's the puddle of clothes there, right? So that's what our mind does. But what did the text say? Of two men, which one's going to be taken? One of them, but what do we know about that one? Is he righteous or is he unrighteous? He's unrighteous. Let me explain. He says here that when the coming of the Son of Man comes, it'll be like the days of Noah, right? We already established that. From the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood uh, came and took them all away. And so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So there's a reference to all those who are just going about their business. Noah goes into the ark. The flood comes and takes them away. The flood didn't take Noah away. The flood took everyone else away. And then it goes on to say that in the same way, two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other will be left. The parallel it gives to us is those that were taken out by the wrath of God in the flood. Okay, this is not a verse that says that the people of God are going to go up and leave their clothes. Not what it says, not at all. So sometimes it helps for these different passages to look at the context, to do a little bit of theology work with it, look at commentaries if you need to, and what you'll come away with, God willing, is an understanding that says, yes, yes, there is a day when we're all going to go up with him. But it's not going to be the secret thing that our culture is propagating. Now, how did we get, in 21st century North American evangelical Christianity, how did we get to the point where we think that the rapture is going to involve us disappearing in some secret thing, and then, and then after we're, we're gone, Christ will, will return and reign for a thousand years here on, the, on earth? How did we even get to the sort of, of, uh, of belief, end times belief system that is so dominant in evangelical circles. How did we get here? What's that? Well, that yeah, poor, yeah, Dar Darby. So let me, let me share briefly. I'm, I'm jumping around a little bit here, but I'm doing it, I guess, because it, uh, it seems to, to fit, fit the study. Let me talk a little bit about the origins of rapture theory, and then we'll get back to the chronology and time frames. Scripture... The four passages we looked at there, that's all the passages you have to work with. If you want to come up with a rapture understanding where the church is taken away and everyone else remains for some extended period of season, and then God deals, well, that's... that's well, 
let me let me let me let me explain that. If if we come to this idea that uh, that the Christ will will um, will take everyone and the, all the believers and then leave everything else relatively as status quo and then set up a, a, a kingdom and then deal with Israel, which is the dominant uh, dispensational view that that God's really mostly concerned with Israel. That what he's really doing in the church is just kind of getting out of the way because he wants to get back to, to Team Israel. That's a, a dispensational view. Let me, let me give you this history. Ralph, what's the name? John Darby. Darby. John Nelson Darby in the 1830s-ish. He's a Presbyterian minister. Actually, he was with the Plymouth Brethren, but this guy named John Darby. Across almost 2,000 years of church history, no one had this view of the rapture that's dominant today. But Darby, Darby had some interesting theology, not necessarily just about the rapture, but in general about God's plan for the nations. So Darby was a, a thinker. I think he was also a bit of a heretic, but he was a thinker, and he thought about this. He says, all right, how does God deal with, uh, th uh, with mankind throughout redemptive history? And what he determined is that across redemptive history, God has dealt with mankind in different dispensations of time. That in, in a dip, one season of time, he dealt this way. And then in another area of time, he dealt slightly different. And what he saw was that there's different dispensations, that if we go back to church history, we see that there's blocks of time by which God has dealt with his people. And the understanding coming out of that theology is that right now we're in the second to last uh, dispensation. There's only one left in that school of thought. We're in the second to last. But what has to happen at the, at the end of this dispensation of time? Well, the dispensation of time that we're in right now, the, the belief system is that we're in uh, the church age, which is uh, kind of, if you have a sentence, and the sentence is Israel, 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 church, Israel, 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 the sentence basically, he says, we're in this parenthesis, the church age. God, up to the church age, had been dealing predominantly through Israel, and he's going to get back to that game plan. But in order to get back to that game plan, what does he have to do to the church? He has to take them out. Okay? So what we see is the rapture actually flowed from his view of how God deals with Israel, and his thinking about that compelled him to this belief system that at a certain point the church would be removed would be removed, and then God could get back to his plan with, uh, with, uh, with ethnic Israel. Now, does God still have a plan for Israel? That's a long answer, uh, a, a different topic, but I, I, I believe the answer is yes. Uh, different story, we can talk about it a, a different night. But at this time, there was this view that God deals with things in dispensations. Now, this was unheard of, really, up until this time. There was hints of occasional church writers, but this was not normal. Any view of, the, of the, the, the rapture as being this thing that, by which the church would be taken out and then God would get back to dealing with the nations and dealing with Israel primarily, that was unheard of across centuries. The church fathers never knew that, especially the, the, the part that would have offended the church fathers to no end is this idea that a lot of people have right now. They say, okay, so tribulation's coming, Right? You see the newspapers, right? You see how scary things are getting? And in fairness, it's actually getting kind of scary. Well, a lot of modern believers say, well, it's getting scary, scary. But, but, good news, good news. Before it gets really scary, you know what's going to happen? God's going to take us out of here, right? The view that's dominant right now amongst many who believe in dispensational theology is this idea that at a certain point, tribulation will start, but either pre-trib, which is a dominant view, before it gets bad, or maybe mid-trib, maybe in the middle there somewhere, God will rescue the church so that they don't have to undergo it. The pre-trib uh, dispensational uh, uh, millennials, the, the understanding is that what will happen near the end, and I know there's a lot more syllables than we have time to explain there tonight, but the understanding that's most dominant in our culture is that if things will get bad someday, there'll be a tribulation, an antichrist figure, man of sin, all this stuff, judgment and bulls and trumpets and scary, scary stuff. But good news for you and for me, we won't be here to face it, we won't undergo the, that tribulation, that persecution. And so a lot of folks, they are excited about that, understandably. I don't want to undergo that sort of level of, of you know, t that sounds terrifying, some of the things that, that uh, may be on the horizon. 
So it's understandable that some folks say, yeah, I don't really want that to happen uh, to me and to adopt a, a pre-trib mindset that God will take everyone out. Well, here's the thing. I said it, it would offend the church fathers. Do you know why it would have offended the church fathers? Because tribulation didn't get much worse than what they were facing. Right. They were living in all sorts of massacres of the faithful. Literally, Nero was, was lighting Christians uh, on fire to light up his gardens. Literally, Christians were being fed to lions in the Circus Maximus. It didn't get much worse than what it was like to be a Christian in the first couple centuries post-Jesus, especially in Rome. Now, if you were to go to certain areas right now, if you were a believer in, in Iran, Iraq, any number of places today, China, do you think you'd face any persecution, tribulation? Yes. So this idea of 21st century North American evangelical Western Christianity is that we'll get to escape all that when the whole witness of the history of Christendom is that the church grows through the blood of the martyrs. The whole witness is one, and I'm sorry to say it if you've never heard it before, but honestly, persecution, if, if it happened to Jesus, why would it not happen to the, to the lot of those who follow in his footsteps? In fact, Jesus promised that. If they hate me, what did he say? They will hate you too. Right, he repeatedly identifies, take up your cross and follow me. It's this picture that life is not lollipop lane. Now, in fairness, you and I have it more comfortable than many, and, and so we, you know, and, and that's a blessing. That's 100% a blessing. That's, that's wonderful that God has blessed us in, in this way. But to say that it's normative for Christians to avoid any sort of persecution or tribulation, let alone in the last days, whenever they should be, you know, next week or a thousand years from now, it's just not what Scripture says. Scripture repeatedly gives a picture. And I understand that people have different eschatology, and I'm not going to try to, to have, uh, explain all the different nuances here. But it's understandable that some folks would like things to get better or to improve or at the very least to be taken out before that happens. But it's not necessarily the witness of what we see here in the book. With that said, Darby, Darby taught this idea of dispensationalism of which the rapture was a feature. It, uh, the rapture wasn't the main teaching. Dispensationalism was. But the rapture was one of, his, uh, one of the things that was catchy to people for understandable reasons, because it was this idea of the church just being taken up, and everyone kind of seized in on that. It was easy to commercialize it back then. Now, at that time, Darby, during his, his life and the years after he developed his teaching, he shopped it around a little bit. You know, he workshopped it, and he didn't get a whole lot of takers. Uh, but there was a few. Uh, D.L. Moody, I think, was, was one that was very open to this, uh, to, to this viewpoint, and, and Moody had a lot of strengths uh, in his own way. But Moody was uh, embraced it to a degree. But there was another guy. His name was uh, C.I. Schofield, Charles something something Schofield. C.I. Schofield. Now, C.I. Schofield uh, came into the ministry a little bit later in life, and he had a number of gifts, and, and one of his gifts was the, the written word. And, and Schofield was famous uh, for, um, for producing something called the Schofield Study Bible. Now, if you have a, a Bible at home, there's a chance that when you open it up, you'll look down and you'll see that there's Bible words, and then at the bottom there might be a block of text explaining what the other text says, right? Commentaries, Bibles have inline commentaries or notes on the edges. Well, for the longest time, that wasn't a thing. For the longest time, the Bible was the Bible was the Bible. There was no, like, Bible slash, you know, additional notes at the bottom. I mean, the Reformation, they fought just to get it in, you know, in the German language, just get it out of Latin. Well, for a long time, people didn't have any study aids. So what happened with the Schofield Bible was this is the introduction of study aids, right? It was like, you know, Ligonier's the, the table talk, only it was at the bottom of your Bible. You could read a difficult passage and immediately look down and see footnotes or see commentaries. And that was desirable for folks. It's still desirable for folks, assuming what? Assuming it's correct, assuming that whatever's at the bottom lines up with what's at the top. Well, I don't want to throw everything Schofield ever did under the bus, but I will say this. Schofield, when it came to the passages we talked about today, these passages in the notes, in the commentary, were comments that affirmed a dispensational uh, pre-trib rapture as something uh, to help understand or to define what these passages said. 
So in the Schofield Study Bible, there's a number of references to, to rapture and dispensational thinking, which up until, again, the 1830s, no one knew, no one thought, no one had ever spent time meditating upon. But the minute it was mass-produced, there was in the first 10 years, there was a million copies of the Schofield Bible. By World War II, there was 2 million plus that had been floating around and copied and so forth. Millions Millions of these Bibles got spread, spread out amongst a pastor that at the time, uh, many of which were ill-trained, Ill and so they'd given them a Bible that has the notes at the bottom. They began to preach what it says in relation to the notes. Before long, what happens? Before long, this idea of pre, uh, the preacher of rapture and all this stuff gets uh, a, 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 not just a foothold, but a stranglehold on our understanding of eschatology. It was not championed by great, uh, wonderful reformers or theologians or the like. Uh, what made it uh, so um, uh, spread as fast as it did was the, the mechanism of the study Bible. Now, again, study Bibles can be wonderful, but they're only wonderful in as much as they echo what actually is in Scripture. So that's how, that's how the... The uh, of, of, of simple, uh, streamlined understanding of how rapture theology gained, uh, gained some prominence in our country was th th this mechanism, was the study bubble. Now, across the decades since, I've already alluded to this before, but dispensational, uh, premillennial dispensationalism, the, the uh, rapture stuff, it became popular not just because of Schofield, but also because it was just so catchy and it was easy to commercialize as we've already talked about with you know, books and, and the movies. You know something else? I'll tell you something else that's interesting. A few years ago, uh, when I had a chance to go to Israel, I was going to go again in February, but that's not going to happen. Uh, but when I did go to Israel and got to tour everything, one of the places we went on the last day was something called uh, the Temple Institute. Does anyone know what that is? Okay, the Temple, the Temple Institute. Where we pray in the temple, that's right. We pray in the temple, but the institute is a organization that they set up in Jerusalem with the idea of rebuilding the future temple. Okay, so the temple institute is something that exists in Jerusalem right now, and it's where scholars and academics and folks uh, are trying to plan for the future construction of the third temple. And when I was there, you know, I was there as part of a tour group, which they, they were taking the tour buses and dropping them off right at the door of the Temple Institute, where they would talk at great length about how exciting it is. They found the red heifer, you know, some special cow. They, they've, they've sewn the priestly garments. They've done all these things. And any day now, the construction will start on the third temple. That's what they were telling us. Now, why were they telling us, a bunch of evangelical Christians, all that? Whoever said money, we're, we're, yeah. whoever said money, you're exactly right. Uh, what I dis discerned from all this was here's, there is an incredible impetus to bringing uh, well-meaning, well-meaning Christian tourists uh, into Israel to see the Holy Land, but then also to bring them to a place that talks about the future of the Holy Land and the, and the third temple, which is a dominant idea within uh, dispensationalism. They want a third temple. Now, why do they want a third temple? <laughs> right. right. There, there's probably more than, one, more than one reason, but they, their belief system, some people look at the last chapters of Ezekiel, others look at different references, and they say, you know, there really needs to be a third temple. And so at the Temple Institute, they'll be talking about how they're going to reinstitute all the sacrifices and do all this, and you have the Christians there, they're, they're kind of you know, excited about this. I was dying. Do you know why? I was literally just sitting there just, da! I do not want, nor should you want, nor should any Christian want a temple to be reinstituted where they start slaughtering animals again. Why should you not want that? Right. Because, because of three little words. It is finished. The whole book of Hebrews was written to tell a Hebrew Jewish audience that all of that, the temple, the sacrifices, all of it, 
pointed forward to the person and work of Jesus Christ, to the fulfillment, the completed person and work. He was the fulfillment of all those things. All that was neon signs pointing to him. Now that he has come, now that he has lived, now that he has died and furthermore been resurrected and ascended, there is no further need for a temple in Jerusalem. There is definitely no further need for any additional sacrifices. What is a sacrificing another cow or another goat or another sheep going to do on top of the sacrifice that Christ has given? It is the gravest of heresies to say we need any more sacrifices in Jerusalem. But, but it is a dominant thought within dispensationalism that we need this temple because there has to be a temple and the abomination of desolation has to occur before Jesus will come back. Again, if you were with us in our study of Ezekiel, you understand that's not quite how that, how that works. I don't have the time tonight to go into all these things. But what I will say is that rapture theology has uh, not coincidentally uh, involved a great deal of monetization, and it is also one of the key fabrics that binds uh, our relationship with, with Israel to this day, geopolitically, which I'm all for, don't, don't, don't hear that as a critique, but it's one of the fabrics, the church being interwoven into the history and the future of Israel is a desirable outcome for nation states that have a whole lot of interest in propagating a theology, whether it's true or not. Understand? Because there are other benefits they derive from it. Premillennial dispensational theology may or may not be true, but there's a whole lot of powerful uh, nations, uh, uh, companies, powers that be, that gain a whole lot more from it, whether it is true or not, than they ever would from, say, covenant theology, of which they won't profit a dime. So there's more to that than I have time to get into, but what I will say is that it's worth, whenever you spy out a heresy, sometimes to look at those who are propagating it and what their reasons for it might be. All right, let's, let's return to the timelines, to chronology and timelines. Now, within uh, this uh, idea of, um, uh, of a rapture, we've already established that we believe the rapture to be biblical. At some point, God is going to say, all right, my people, you know, the trumpet's going to blast, and his people, including those who predeceased us, the saints, wherever they may be, will rise and will meet him in the air. Now, when do we believe that happens? The last, the end, the final trumpet, right? All the language speaks to this as something that occurs not at some early stage. The, the, uh, uh, the dispensationalists believe he, he comes sneakily, stealthily first, you know, whistles everybody to come to him, and then he returns with all the power later. We don't do that. We say that he comes at the end. But many believe that he will come at the outset. This is called the pre-trib uh, rapture. They believe that at any moment now, he might come and, and gather us who are believers uh, home to him. Uh, through a secret uh, 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 rapture, and then at a later point he might uh, he might r uh, return for for the rest. So they see it as a two a two pronged uh, rapture. There's also a mid trib uh, mid trib rapture, which uh, presumes that there will be a tribulation, whether it's seven years or seventy, whatever it is. There's some belief that at the three and a half year mark or some middle point, that at that point the rapture will occur and the saints will be brought to him. There are some who believe it'll happen towards the very end, that the rapture will occur pre-wrath. And what I mean by that is that tribulation will come, but before God really lets the world have it, that at that point, the saints will be taken home. And there's, the, the further out you put this rapture, the more things actually make sense. So this is one of those things that there are good theologians who believe this, that we'll be here for a season of tribulation, but right before the, you know, the final bowls or judgments drop, that at that point, the church will be removed. Well, finally, there's what we call the post-trib understanding of the rapture. And the post-trib understanding of the rapture is what we've been talking about tonight. It says that whatever the future holds, however challenging it might be, whatever persecution might befall either us or our distant, distant relatives somewhere in the future, that at the end of that season, however long it is or isn't, that Jesus will return at the end of it. To, his victory will, will be uh, demonstrated through the sounding of the last trumpets. Uh, at that point, there will be not a secret, but a clear and evident resurrection of his saints. And those who are alive in that generation, whenever it should be, will join him in the air. Now, on your own, my encouragement would be to look at these four passages and see if you can derive from them anything that speaks to pre-trib, uh, mid-trib, pre-wrath, or post-trib uh, um, 
rapture. My sense is that if you utilize the same tools they utilized for 1,800 years after Christ, you'll come away with the impression that, well, Jesus appears to call his church home at the very end of things, at the very end of days. Now, let me offer a, a brief bit of good news. This is not intended to be a full dialogue on eschatology. I don't, we don't have the time to look at all the avenues that I know our, our brains are, are probably thinking all sorts of different things or questions. We can't explore all that right now. But let me introduce one thing that is kind of cool. There, well, I believe Scripture does, it does tell us that uh, the church will not uh, be vacated until the very end. At the same time, there are verses and passages in Scripture that say that when things get bad, whatever that looks like and whenever that happens, that a, a mark or something positive will be upon, a spiritual mark will be upon the children of God, and in a sense, they will be set aside and protected from aspects of that tribulation. So if you look at the various seals and bowls of judgments in the book of Revelation, depending on when you believe these events occur, and trust me, there's a whole lot of variances here. But if you have the idea that that's future, that that stuff's future, something you'll notice is that there are references that speak to God's preservation of faithful and his desire to protect him from some of the things that will befall those uh, that are the recipients of his wrath. So just as he sent an ark in the time of Noah to preserve faithful, there is some sense in which faithful ones will be preserved in whatever season, whatever time such a thing occurs. So that's a good and positive thought to think about, even if you come to a conclusion that the church will still be here during difficult seasons. It's good to know that, that God has a sustaining grace that will be provided even during the, that uh, difficult time. All right, let me just uh, look, uh, look to uh, wrap, uh, wrap up here with there's a couple last thoughts. I skipped past, when I was talking about uh, pre-trib uh, dispensationalists, you asked, we, there was a comment you made regarding kind of the chronology and the time frame. Let me share with you the, the, the chronology for how most folks in our present day and age think things are going to go down. All right, the first thing they believe is this, that the church age will end with the secret rapture. Okay, so that's the dominant view in modern evangelical Christianity, that, uh, that we're in this church age. Remember Israel, 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 church, Israel, Israel? So the dominant view of most modern evangelicals is that the church age will end, that parenthesis will come to a close with this secret rapture. So that's step one. Now, the belief then is that everyone who's left will go through some sort of seven-year, give or take, but some seven-year period of tribulation. Then Christ will return with the church. Okay, at this point, Christ does come back. He secretly came and got and, and ferried everyone out, but then he returns after this tribulation, and then he will reign. Not only does he come and, and return with the church, but the idea in, in premillennial dispensationalism is that when he comes back, we're coming back too, and we'll reign here on earth for how long? For a thousand years, right? Which is, a, we did a whole different class two years ago on the millennium. And there's, a, there's, again, more than we can get into. But that's the understanding, that he'll come back and reign in Jerusalem for a thousand, uh, a thousand uh, years with, with the temple and all that having been redone, the temple that we don't think we need. And then, now, this is where it gets kind of odd, if it's not already odd yet. But then there's the thought that after he's reigned for a thousand years, that someone, doodly doodly do, someone will come back. Do you know who it is? Right, the devil will be released. He's been bound, right? Remember the references to that? He will be bound for this a thousand years, and then he will be released at this, this time, and he'll bring about one last rebellion, right? So Jesus has reigned. Things have been cool for a thousand years. Everything is just going splendidly. Uh, I don't know why they believe this happens, but they think everything's going splendidly. But then, doodly doodly do, then the devil's released. He comes out of the pit, arr, and then the nations rebel one more time. Right? One more time against uh, God, and then finally a final judgment occurs. What's that? Being cast in the lake of fire. Then, right, at this point, you, being locked up and bound wasn't enough. Then finally the devil and the false prophets and all, the, all of the rebellious lot are finally dealt with and cast into the, the burning lake of fire. There's this idea that he comes back and there's some rebellion. I don't know what the, the time frame for that is. But if you see, now what I just said, 
whether you've believed that past, present, future, I hope not, but whether you've ever believed that, uh, the, what I would tell you is that that is the dominant understanding in much of modern evangelical uh, Christianity, that this is the picture, that you'll have this secret rapture, the church will, will be gone, then there'll be this seven-year uh, period of tribulation here on earth, then Christ will return with the church and, you know, the sounds and the trumpets and the like, and then he'll reign there in Jerusalem when the temple, you know, like we need that, he'll reign here on earth for some reason for a thousand years, and when it's over, you know, he's got to let the devil out, all right, you've been in time out long enough, Come on out, and then the devil will, will deceive nations again, and there'll be this another big epoch of sinfulness, and then finally God says, all right, now I, I, I if you thought I was done with you before, now I'm really done, all right? I, now, now you're really going to get it, and now you're cast into the lake of fire. That's the dominant mindset that is taught in these eschatological circles. And what I would submit to you is that although I don't have a monopoly on this, and I know that no one in this room has a monopoly on all this, what I would tell you is that the, the default view that we have in the world around us, it, it borrows from fiction more than it does from Scripture. It borrows from what we want the end times to be like and how we want to avoid things and what we desire to have and not so much what Scripture says. Scripture promises that there will be seasons of difficulty and tribulation. Whether we happen to live through that tribulation or not, most of us know something, a taste of what that is like, and that's normative for those who follow, follow Christ. But in time, in time, the good news is that when God has saved every last man, woman, and child he plans to save, at that time, he's coming back. And when he comes back, it may be at the end of a season of great rebellion, and it may have all these hallmarks of judgment and everything else we see in Revelation. It may. I don't pretend to understand all of the manifestations of these things, but it may have all that. But when he returns, I can assure you this much, this much I am confident on. When he comes back, that's it, and that's all. There's, what's that? Well, that's the question. There's folks who will say he comes back at all these different intervals. My view is the next time you see him, assuming we, we get a chance to, it, he's coming in glory. That's it. That he's not coming secretly on different intervals to do different things. My sense, and again, I... You do your own Berean work when it, with eschatology and with the Bible. But my sense is that when Christ returns, he will return as the Lion of Judah. He will return in victory. He will return in glory. There will be trumpets. There will be all of these different things. And that will be the end. And judgment will come with him. And that the rapture, such as it is, will occur in that time, not at some various intervals or stages earlier on. Now, again, let me be clear. I do not want to say any of these things. I know I'm speaking dogmatically, but let me be clear. Uh, I am uncertain on aspects of this, as I suspect that you are probably too. There's a lot of this that we will not have our eschatology perfected until we're on that side of the veil. We will at some point. You'll, you'll know all Revelation. You'll have it down like that. Won't that be nice? You'll know Daniel and Revelation and Ezekiel. You'll have it all polished. On this end, we're still seeing through a glass darkly. And God has couched a lot of these events using language that is figurative. And he's used as symbols and imagery and the like that is difficult to parse. So some of the manifestations of these things, we have to be humble enough to say, all right, I don't, uh, here's my understanding, but, but God doesn't have to operate based on my understanding. So we have to be humble and, and say that we may have aspects of this, uh, that we, we, we believe everything we believe based on our understanding of Scripture, but we are not infallible in our understanding. So we're humble in that case. But, but I think we can stand on a couple of things. Number one, Jesus is coming back. That's number one. He is returning. And when he returns, it brings both judgment to the rebellious and, uh, and victory to the saints. We see that the, that the church of militant is, it becomes the church triumphant. We see that whoever is dead at that time is in faith, whoever is alive at that time in faith, every ounce of faith they had in life or in death will be validated like that when he comes back in that trumpet sounds. That much I am sure of, even as other aspects of this are challenging to parse.